How many of us would say that we work our butts off where we do everything? We go high intensity, we run around the gym, we lift heavy weights, and still we can't burn that much calories. And so this post came in through our private uh, members only VIP group. And Maria said that she just did her workout this morning. And I know Maria and Maria works really hard. Like if there's somebody that's out working her out there, it's hard to find. And she goes, she always works on her feet and she finished work at 3.30 PM, had an early dinner and then rest for an hour and hit the bed and checked her calorie count and was only at 1248 which you would think after doing a hardcore workout where your heart rate was going, look at her, her heart rate was at 160. And, and uh, I mean, that's a very high number for, for when you're working out. Like that's the extreme zone. And so she's like, I have to get dressed, go to Kildonan Park and did her two routines going around the park with working out on the beach. So she basically went out and did another hardcore workout just to be able to burn more calories. Now, here's the thing about doing something like that is that when you do what's called overtraining or when you do too much training there, you got to find that fine line that your body's working through. And so if you're a trained athlete, meaning that somebody that's used to hardcore training consistently and you do it five, six days a week, then yeah, your body will be trained and, and you know, the younger you are, the more pliable you are. So the faster you're going to recover, but for the rest of us that are doing this more for a lifestyle, if we're out there and we're, we're training so hard and then we do a double training and then we try to do that seven days a week, it's only going to lead to three things. Number one, you're going to be extremely sore and the extreme, the extreme soreness is going to happen within the joints. Number two is that you're going to get sick, right? Before the body really breaks, it's going to let you know that it's like you need to take a break. And so it's either going to give you, uh, some type of migraine, it's going to give you extreme fatigue, or you're just going to start to develop a little bit of a cough because it's the first signs of saying, Hey, like my body, your like your body needs, your body needs to chill back a little bit. And I'm not saying complete rest, right? But what I'm saying is that you want to scale back. So if you're that day, so if you did a hardcore workout, plus you, you did all in your feet and then you went and did two workouts, that would be an extreme day. So where do you go backwards from that? Well, maybe you do the one workout at home and then focus on your nutrition and focus on your flexibility. Then the last and final, what's going to happen to you is you're going to get some type of injury. Now you're not playing high professional sports, so you're not going to go out there and break a leg or you're not going to go out there and break an arm, but your lifestyle is that you're going to start to, you'll pull something in your hip flexor. You might put your back out. You might, uh, you know, tear a quad muscle. And so that's where you're going to get to. And then that's a whole nother animal because I always say it's almost impossible to focus on weight loss when you're injured. The first thing you need to do is get your body back to 100%. And to do that, you need to do recovery tools. You need to go slow. And so your nutrition has to be completely changed to reflect your decrease in activity. And also when you're not working out like as hard as you normally would, then you have to, you have to take that into account as well. And so those are the three elements of what could happen if you start to overtrain. But here's some, here's some actual facts about why you're not burning that many meat calories and especially if it's reflected from your watch, okay? So number one is that your smart watches, all your smart watches go off your heart rate, okay? And your heart rate doesn't necessarily dictate the amount of work that you're putting in for the day. So if the better you, you're in shape, the lower your heart rate is gonna be because the more conditioned it gets. So I'll give you a prime example. You, are, you went from the blue, working out on the blue with us, with the coaches. And so let's say that you've been doing it for six months straight. When you first started on the blue, your heart rate was probably elevated high. So your average heart rate throughout that entire workout was probably in and around 125 to 135. Okay. There's, there's things with that, that that's scary because you're, if you weren't trained and you're not used to that, that level, then that's a lot of demand on that heart rate. But 
because you've been consistent and you've been coming consistently and you've been pushing yourself every single day in the workout, what ends up happening is your heart rate will gradually, like the amount of heart or energy output that is required for you when you're working out becomes less, right? Because your heart rate gets more conditioned, okay? And so when your heart rate, initially when you start a, a, a new workout routine, so whether it be on the blue, whether it be out in a park, whether it be on a hill, whether it be doing strong by Zoom, by Jen, whether it be back on the blue, whatever it is, going for a run, whatever it is, eventually your heart rate is gonna level that off, right? Because it shouldn't have to work as hard at something that you've gotten better at, right? Remember when we used to not know how to read and we were trying to read and write and it was just so hard and so difficult and every day you were learning so much and it was so exhausting. And then eventually you just write without even thinking, right? And, and so that's kind of like the flow is that as your body and your brain and your, your heart get conditioned with the exercises that you're doing, that's when it's going to, it's going to uh, just decrease the amount of output. You don't want your heart, <laughs> like you don't want your heart rate working that high, right? When they measure people that have heart problems and if their heart rate is elevated, they're going to try to find a way to get it down because that's, it, that'd be like me sitting here with my bicep. And just constantly flexing, 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 and I'm flexing, and I'm flexing, and I'm doing this all day. What's going to happen to that muscle, right? It's going to get jacked, yeah, but it's going to eventually give up and tear, right? And I'm going to be extremely sore. Now, the difference is you don't feel your sore heart muscle, but you are doing like, you know, it's your heart will adapt to it, but then there's a lot of repetition. So you don't want your heart rate to be high like that constantly especially throughout the rest of your day now the thing about smart watches is that they only take your they don't take your muscle mass into account so when you're filling out your smart watch right they're asking you what's your height what's your age what's your uh you know height wage and eight and, uh, eight, and weight height height weight and age okay and so what they're doing is they're trying to determine what a basal metabolic rate is so what what is your resting resting caloric burn. So that's what they're trying to determine. And I'll tell you, like I'm, I'm about 150 pounds. I'm probably like, I don't know, like 13, maybe 12% body fat. Right. And uh, I'm closer to like 45% muscle. Right. And so if I did just based around muscle alone, so let's say I'm, I'm 40, so my weight 150 times 45% equals so that's 60 67.5 pounds of muscle that i have in my body now it takes about 30 calories to keep that to keep that alive i if i just right now laid in my bed and did bare minimum right just laying there doing absolutely nothing drinking water watching sons of anarchy and i did that for a 24 hours uh period then I would still have to consume 2000 calories to feel my muscles and to make sure that my body doesn't start to lose weight, right? And mo mostly muscle weight, right? Muscle is highly demanding. So the first thing I'm gonna lose when I start to lose that weight is gonna be muscle mass. And so when you punch it into the watch, the watch doesn't do that calculation for me because it doesn't know my muscle mass. And most people don't use body fat scales, right? Most people don't know how much how much muscle mass they have. And so it's almost impossible to do that. So they, they only take into account general terms, right? So what are the general terms? Well, weight, height, and age. So roughly somebody at this height, at that age category that weighs this much should have a, a, a basal metabolic or a resting, raising, resting metabolic rate of this. And so like on my watch, they recommend that I consume closer to like 1600 calories, right? Just to maintain what, what, like what I am right now. But if I do 1600 calories on an average day right now, and, and especially since I'm coaching more, I'm burning 3,200 calories. Okay. Now think about that. I'm on average over a seven day span. My Garmin watch measures that I'm burning just over 3,200 calories. Now, if I went off my 
if I went off what my muscle mass is, so just enough calories to keep my muscle alive so I won't lose my muscle, that's 2,000 calories. That's a 1,000 calorie gap, right? And that gap is so enormous that I could probably do it for a couple of days. And you know what? Honestly, I'll look phenomenal, right? Like I'll do it, I'll do it for like a Saturday or maybe like a Wednesday, Thursday so that I can look beach ready on a, on a Saturday, Sunday. But if you're expecting me to have any energy to be able to do anything on a Saturday or Sunday because my caloric deficit is so high, it's not going to happen, right? So like, yeah, I look great for the beach because I shred off a bunch of water, shred off maybe a couple pounds, but then that whole day is going to be like no functioning, right? Because my brain doesn't have the feel, my muscles aren't properly fueled, right? And my body's going into deprivation mode. And so it's like, yeah, I'm losing weight, but I'm also losing a lot of other things. So long term, if I have that big of a caloric deficit, then what ends up happening is it'll slow, it'll, my body will slow down. I won't be able to work out as hard. And, and I have to, like, I'm just going to be constantly hungry, right? That's just too big of a gap for my body to, to say that this is okay. So that's another thing is it's not taking your muscle mass into account. So if I plugged in how much my muscle mass into there, then you would see how many calories I'm actually burning. So not just based around my heart rate, but if each pound, if each pound of muscle is requiring 30 calories, then I have to take an effect that when I'm working out just based around my watch, that's taking white uh, height, age, and weight. It's not enough. I have to take into account how many calories my muscles are burning. And so when you take the calories that your muscles are burning, it's probably going to be like 20 or 30% more because, because you, you, so if they put two people side by side, so they put Maria, right. And who is a beast training for like, has been doing tons of training, has very high muscle mass. And then they put her twin next to her. She doesn't have a twin but they put her twin next to her, but her twin doesn't work out, lives a sedentary lifestyle and sits at a desk. Okay. So Maria is probably closer to 35% muscle mass and uh, Maria's twin sits closer to 20% muscle mass. And this is, these are true numbers. Like I know most people, when they sign up with us, they're closer to 20, 20% muscle mass. So you think about that, that's like a 15% difference. Right. And so the amount of calories that Maria is burning per effort, she's obviously lifting more. She's moving faster. She has more endurance, right? She's burning 30% more calories than this person per, per like pound of muscle. Right. And so, but the watches are only lumping them as one. Does that make sense? Right. So the watch is saying, well, I don't know. I don't know how much muscle mass Maria has, but I know based around old science of like the BMI, this is what Maria should be burning, but we're going to lump her and this person into the same, into the same category. And so when she does this workout, doesn't matter if it's this person that has more muscle or this person that has little muscle, they're both burning the same amount of calories. Now you've watched this video does that make any sense? So I'm not saying that the watch is like a bad tool to have because it's off, but it's like jumping on the scale. So you jump on the scale, you've been working out five days a week, your body is so sore, you've been eating clean, but yet you lost a pound. And you're like, man, I lost a pound. What did I do this week? You know, oh my God, I, it's, it's like I did nothing. But it's like, but did you do nothing? Because I saw you on the gym and you absolutely crushed it. And if you had one of these watches on, I know you burnt like 300 calories. Plus, instead of having a big old smoothie, you had a black coffee, right? So you made a bunch of changes that are going to reflect maybe not right now. And the fact that you lost weight right now shows that your body is going in the right way. So give it time, be consistent with it. And you'll see those results after about four to six weeks. And so the, does the scale, does the watch determine your long-term efforts and the amount of calories that you're burning and how lean you're going to get. No, it's a tool, right? I would say that you should get one so that you could track that. And then you can set a benchmark of how many calories you should be burning, but you also have to take into effect all those other, all those other factors. Now, the last one is not every, every workout requires a high demand. And I'll give you a perfect example on Friday. 
sorry, Thursday. On Thursday, we did an upper body workout. And upper body workout was much slower than last week, week's Wednesday, right? So last week, Wednesday, we did a, like reverse burpees. We did high knee brush and twists. We did skater bounds. You know, it was a very high intensity, high demanding of the body where you burnt a lot of calories because there was no real rest. There was no like, there was real no hit, right? So, so high intensity intervals. There wasn't a whole lot of intervals going on within that program because it was always up here and then a very small, small drop. And then up here, very small drop. Up here, very small drop. And that's a great way. And I love those workouts. And that's why we incorporate them into, you know, into our workouts almost every day is that those are where you're going to burn a bunch of calories, right? And, and those are the ones that are like, that make you sweat really. But if you want to get a physique change, if you want to start to look like if you want, so that will help you lose the weight and get you in shape. Okay. Now, if you want to start to see more muscle tone and you want to build more strength, then we have to live weight, lift weights. And unfortunately, when you lift weights, you don't generally lift them very fast right? I want to do a bicep curl. I'm not curling like this with my heaviest weight. It just won't happen. Resistance training is progressively overloading yourself so that you can train a muscle so that it gets stronger. And when it gets stronger, the muscle will start to pop out more because your body fat drops. So when we combine the two, we're not only dropping the body fat, but we're also building the muscle. And you can't have one without the other. There can't be just a strength component. You want to go and do just the strength component and lift heavy weights right? Because you think it's going to change you or challenge you. It might change and challenge you in a very slow way, but the way that you want to look, if you want to like lose weight, fit your skinny jeans better, if you want to look more toned, lean, athletic, more abs, then you need to do the, the hit training with the strength training. Okay. You can't just pick one and just do that. You can't just go running and hope that you're going to get and look the results of somebody that's doing hit. And you can't just do hit training right? Where it's like boot camp style outdoors, or just like the jumping jacks and the burpees, you can't think that you're going to get that way. And or, or do that and then look like somebody that is more of like a physique model, right? So the people that are lifting weights, where you can see like their shoulders, you can see their triceps, you, you wouldn't get the same type of look as that, but you can't go either way, like running isn't the best to, to, to give you the best physique or the best look that you want. And, bo and bodybuilding or weightlifting isn't the best way. It's the mix mosh of all the three. And that's what we do here at Fit Club. And so when you're doing a bicep curl, like I know it seems kind of slow and kind of boring, right? I don't know. Like even when I'm teaching the classes, how do I hype up a bicep curl? But a bicep curl is just the slow work that you put in, right? And it's, it's, the, it's the pump. It's the muscle pump. It's, it's, it's pushing the muscle past its capacity. Now, I'm not saying you need to go fully past its capacity, but if you're curling, let's say you got a single dumbbell and you got, you got a 10 pounder and you're curling that dumbbell, you're curling that dumbbell, you're curling that dumbbell. And in 30 seconds, you get like, you know, 45 reps. Like if you're not, if you're getting more than one to one, so like one rep for one second, then you're definitely going too light. And so you challenge yourself to go up to the 12s. And then you eventually want to peak off in and around that 10 to 15 rep range. Nothing less than 10, nothing more than 15, unless it's a high intensity du du duplicated move. But if it's a basic shoulder side raise, bicep curl, pec, row, then you want to be in and around that 10 to 15 rep range. And so, but when you're lifting weights like that, you got to think about it. Your heart rate isn't, it's down, right? And so if you're doing a workout routine that is focusing more on muscle toning and building, then your heart rate and the amount of calories that you burn isn't going to be up there. And so don't be so hard on yourself when it isn't. So you, when you got to ask yourself after you finish a workout to know if the workout was a good one. All right. So number one is, are you sweating, right? With these types of workouts, they're designed to make sure that you are sweating because there's a lot of high intensity movements. Number two, are you smiling? It should be smiling, not sweating again. Number two, are you smiling? Did you enjoy the workout that you just did, right? Like for me, if I go through a really hard workout, I will be really smiling because I'm like, oh my God, what did I just do? And then number three is, are you sore, right? And there's levels of sore that you can go through. And um, 
but it's always, it's, it's also a great indicator that you went hard. I mean, if you get really sore the next day and it's not like a pain sore where you're like, you know, you tore something or you broke something, obviously you don't want to go that far. But if you got a, a, a sore butt, some sore pecs, you know, you have trouble doing this. First things I'd tell you is to get moving, right? Get moving, get the blood flowing again. Number two, get a second workout. And number three, always remember that sore equals sexy.